Welcome to Soul News Day with Kevin Clark. I am Kevin Clark. <laughs> what a decade it's been. We started with the Browns as a complete joke and... Mm. Tough. Above the fold. Congratulations to the New York Jets. 4,368 offensive yards this year. They beat by 35 yards. Lamar Jackson as a person. Lamar Jackson did not play in week 17. And if he had, he would have had more yards than an entire franchise. I'm not sure who this says more about, but it certainly says a lot about both things. Lamar Jackson, if you haven't been paying attention, is the best player in football. The Baltimore Ravens, if you haven't been paying attention, are the best team in football. They are the one seed in the AFC. The playoffs start this weekend. A lot of intriguing matchups, but I'll save you some time. The Baltimore Ravens are gonna play the San Francisco 49ers in the Super Bowl in Miami. These are the two clear cut best teams. Baltimore Ravens, first in the NFL in points per drive. They're the only team in the NFL who score on over half of their possessions. They score on 51.8% of their possessions. That's good. They are the seventh best team in history by DVOA. And last week they passed the 1978 New England Patriots as the top rushing team in history. 1978 was the last time we saw a team remotely like the way the Baltimore Ravens run the ball. This is not normal. That brings us to the style of play that both these teams like. They're very different teams, they have very different coaches, very different quarterbacks, but they play a brand of football that is unique in 2019, which is basically bully ball. They beat the crap out of teams. Essentially, what happened was defenses spent the last decade getting smaller, quicker, faster, more spread out because of the way offenses were changing. I understand that. It was very smart of them to do that. But the Baltimore Ravens and the San Francisco 49ers both looked at those defenses and decided to build around a philosophy of stuffing defenses in a locker and just beating people up. That's why you see them running the ball at a historic rate in Baltimore. These are talented, physical teams with elite players on both sides of the ball playing a style that most teams don't see a whole hell of a lot. This is why these teams are not only the two best teams, but good news, we're gonna get to see them play in a month. How's the last hair of 2019 slash first hair of 2020? Great. Yeah. Uh, who's you gonna win the Super Bowl? I don't know. I think it's I, gonna Baltimore Ravens. I don't think it is, just because well, I, I think everybody's gonna pick it. You I know what a, I, I did a open on it. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to check that out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ryan Rossillo. Let's do that again. It's like almost famous. Do you want me to just keep saying your name? No, I just okay. I feel like I wasn't. You like the energy? Here. All right. Yeah. All right, Ryan Rosillo. Yeah. The Browns, huh? Yeah. What's your best Brown story? Uh, I would say that Pat Shermer, one time he saw me in a press box uh, and he he looked at me and I had a full plate of food and he said uh, I had a couple start. couple donuts. And he said, that's a lot, uh, maybe one too many donuts. He said that yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah, he did. And I knew he was joking, but I also knew I was carrying about 50 extra pounds. That's when you were bigger. Yeah, a little bigger. That uh, stung. And so it, it did. You haven't it did. It. And the next month I started to jog and it all changed. There is a legitimate argument to be made that Pat Shermer changed my life. As you say this, I don't know if that paperwork is finalized with the Giants, but that sounds like a leader and a motivator. It is a leader and a motivator. I do think that there are some times where lines are crossed. You'll post something and people start to criticize you and you're like, well, what did you think? Like I mean, thirst traps? I don't know. I mean, I'm not afraid to post a shirts off pick every now and then. And then, you know, guys come at me and they say, what about your legs? I'm like, well, I don't have any pictures of those right now, so. The Freddy thing is a really good example of getting too caught up in the end of year results and then having to dig through those end of year results. And I always call it like that fool's gold few weeks of the season. Mm -hmm. And the Browns are a good example of that. The teams they beat at the end when Baker looked like he got it going with Kitchens, those are all bad football teams. The Cowboys are kind of like that a little bit. When yeah. you win all those one score games, they were incredible in one score games, one on one score game in the playoffs too. Like it's just not really that repeatable. And I also think it's a little lesson for this time of year than going into training camp. I'm just dropping knowledge on Kevin today. I don't even know if we're taping this yet. If you go through every team schedule, each team on average plays like eight and a half one score games a yeah. year. But the new coach or the coach that didn't get fired is gonna go back into the presser to start the 2020 season and go, we were in 10 games. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, no, everybody was in 10 games. So that's my Baker Browns kitchens. Can, can we touch on two Steve Belichick things here? Yes. Because Robert Sala and Belichick got like Christian Leitner's mom type of airtime this year, okay? 
and that's a reference for you kids from the 90s. I but that was a, that was also there. your cameo. And I noticed you sidling. You you waited until the breakup, and then it was like a Kev, hey, Steve. How did that go? I've actually thought a little bit about how nerve-wracking, how awful it would have been had he not shaken my hand back. I would have been owned forever. So I wrote a profile of Steve Belichick two years ago on a Super Bowl media night. And we talked for like 20 minutes because I figured out he, everybody was asking about his dad. It was very clear to me he did not want to talk about his dad. And he kept bringing up his granddad. Cool. So he told right. me all of these stories about how like his grandpa hated broadcasters. And he would always mute the TV and he would just give his own play-by-play. -play. I do think the, the broadcaster thing is kind of funny because I've had this thing, as like you, watching thousands of hours of these games, that there's now something that's happening more and more than ever before. It's the thing that everybody's talking about. Yeah. And Peyton Manning's decline was like the first time it was really gross. Yeah. Where every national guy, because he sat in a, a production meeting with yeah. Peyton, like as soon as Peyton completed 115 yarder, Collinsworth or somebody else in that role that night would be like, yeah, people saying he can't he can't throw that out. Uh, that looked pretty good for Al, you, you know, right? It's vintage Peyton. Right. Like, I'm convinced <laughs> if there were some sort of sports production meeting with North Korea, yeah, like they somehow North Korea would come up during a game and the guy'd be like, hey, you know, a lot of people are saying North Korea, you know, is this is that. Yeah. But if you think of the system that surrounds North Korea, it's really more about the system and not. North Korea. You know, Troy, we talked to Kim Jong-un on Friday, <laughs> telling us a lot of things we didn't know. When they had that old Sunday crew with Mike Patrick and Paul McGuire, Joe Theismann, and then, you know, they'd all be just, you know, kicking it around, and it was fun, you know, it was yeah. fun. And then, you know, Paul McGuire would be like, you don't think that South Korea wants to tackle North Korea? I'm gonna tell you right now, South Korea wants to tackle North Korea. Look at them, look at them out there. Cats? Yeah, cats. It wasn't that bad. Now I'm not a dog guy. So that I could have gone into it a little biased ahead of time. But I'm gonna tell you right now, and I've never seen the original, so maybe for me it's a little different, like experiencing it the first time, but I don't understand why anybody Oh, David over here, in defense of cats. You know what? This fucking business is so lame. What does everyone agree on? Oh, this movie sucks. Alright, my column. In defense of cats. What? Don't get them vaccinated? <laughs> I couldn't believe who was in this. I just want to know if you're working on cats, like if you're in a trailer and James Corden comes in yeah. and Idris Elba's like, and they go, are you fucking kidding? Like, what was that today? All right, let's do state by state. No, state by state. Let's right. do it. Let's do it. All right. It. Yep, Vermont. Yes, let's do Vermont. It was just there. 34 people took advantage. That's the state population. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> 34 people took advantage they get them all together? of the state's aid in dying law in the most recent two-year period studied, according to a report released by the Vermont Department of Health, Ryan Russillo, comment. Pass. <laughs> Joe Walsh, founder of the Eagles. Of the Pearl Harbor Survivors oh, Association. <laughs> different one. Passed away at age 100. The life well lived, I'm sure he did a lot of great stuff. He joined the Marines in 1938, not for the adventure, but for the steady income for, would provide. The enlistment numbers were way down back then, so this guy, Big was, time. This guy was a badass. Joe Walsh, leader of Pearl Harbor chapter. Yeah. He's 100. 100. A life well lived. Welcome to Club Kevin, Joe Walsh. This is about sexual wellness. It's a pamphlet, so you know it's important. <laughs>